Hi there. In this presentation, I want to uh, impart some information about the cosmos um, as I conceptualize it or as I have uh, been inspired to conceptualize it, as it were, um, referring to some of my other videos on Gnostic cosmology. Uh, I came up with this uh, symbol here, um, which, uh, if you remember, uh, it consists of two parallel lines which never meet by definition, uh, and a sort of U-shaped shape which, which unites these parallel lines. Uh, the top line um, is uh, refers to the realm of the transcendental god, uh, the spiritual, and the bottom line refers to the realm of the demiurge or the material. And this follows, of course, the usual um, Gnostic dualism between spirit and matter. However, uh, these and these two parallel lines never meet, so there is no connection normally between spirit and matter. Uh, there is no meeting place, there's no joining of these lines at any point, and they stretch, uh, I said, for, uh, they stretch that way infin infinitely, um, and they stretch uh, that way infinitely, so they've always been, uh, they've never met, and they never will meet, and they don't meet now, except um, that actually they do meet now, in the here and now, uh, because of the action of soul, uh, and Holy Spirit, uh, and Grail, uh, and angels, uh, and other metaphysical beings, uh, and their action when they, as they pass from the uh, realm of the spiritual to the realm of the material, from the realm of the transcendental God to the realm of the Demiurge, uh, as they pass um, from one parallel line to the next, sort of jump from one railway line to the next, to, the, to this railway line, uh, they actually uh, unite uh, momentarily uh, spirit and matter, and we have instances uh, of, of spirit and matter uniting um, at the various points, uh, but that's because of the action uh, of, of, Holy, of the Holy Spirit on the material. And uh, I also said that the, um, this kind of U-shape, uh, horseshoe shape, represents the journey of the soul, uh, from the transcendental realm <coughs> down through the various layers uh, of um, <clears throat> of the demiurge uh, back up to the transcendental realm uh, and the idea is that soul takes knowledge uh, of the material world uh, with it uh, and gained gains wisdom uh, thereby uh, so that's sort of a summary of my beliefs so far, uh, and this the main uh, symbol here uh, is 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 a more refined version, really. Um, and uh, I've re again I've represented the realm of the transcendental God as a space uh, above this uh, above this horizontal line, uh, which again spreads, uh, which which goes infinitely that way. Um, and infinitely the other way, so uh, it's it's an infinite horizontal line, or infinite horizontal series of numbers, as it were, um, which which endlessly repeat, uh, like like in like in uh, pi, um, which which is a number which is endlessly repeating, and um, so uh, that's the idea there, and that's of the sort of space, and I, I mean a line is is should be inverted commas because it's because since there's no time or space or dimension. Uh, it really the line doesn't really mean anything as a description itself. Um, however, uh, when we talk about the material, um, the realm of the demiurge, this is the space underneath this line, uh, which is more like an ellipse, not a straight line, because uh, in fact um, the the realm of the demiurge is a huge, great, sim great sphere. Uh, which basically cover, carries on down below the below the, uh, the 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 limits of this picture of the of this particular um, you know picture is a huge circle basically. So so you know you've got your um, uh, this is the, the the realm of the demiurge as a sort of circle, uh, and then you've got your your U shape here, and you've got your your horizontal line there. Um, and uh, so this is sort of an ellipse, really. Um, and then uh, the area, uh, and then there's, there's a central uh, circle here, 
which defines uh, well below the realm of the of the demi of the line of the demiurge, which is this bit here, um, is is God and soul awareness, uh, and below that um, is is a, is the realm of the of the miraculous, which is created uh, by this horseshoe uh, shape. Uh, which again defines uh, the movement and the action and the influence uh, of transcendental bodies such as the Holy Spirit and the avatar Jesus um, and other avatars and angels and, uh, and of course the journey of the soul. Uh, so they, these follow a path uh, down into the realms of the Demiurge uh, and back up again. Um, and where, where these two, where these lines meet, where this, uh, this horseshoe line uh, meets the ellipse, uh, which defines the limit of the demiurge, uh, the realms of demiurge. This is the sphere of the miraculous, really, at the point. Um, but also, uh, I've got here, uh, the sphere has kind of got little kind of openings here, because this area here is, is sort of a, mer a kind of a strange area of various levels, metaphysical levels, uh, of which it is possible to become aware or conscious, um, such as uh, various uh, refined um, facsimiles of the material world, um, which are nevertheless part of the of the uh, where well, they sort of occupy a grey area between um, the the world, this world, the sphere, of the realm of the demiurge, uh, and the realm of the transcendental god. Uh, but then, as I said before, there is a great abyss uh, somewhere at this point uh, where, where, ev where everything below this line uh, is the actual and where everything above the line is the ideal. Um, and there is division. So we are talking about basically uh, two parallel lines which never meet. Uh, and the bottom parallel line is the, is the limit of the realms of the Demiurge. So you've got two parallel lines. Um, and, and that's sort of the abyss between them. So um, there's a huge jump. Well, I say jump. Um, there's a huge difference uh, between matter and spirit, uh, which is nevertheless uh, united uh, momentarily or occasionally or sometimes miraculously, as it were, uh, by the actions of the, of the various beings, spiritual beings. Um, and the thing is, <clears throat> I, I mentioned all this and I wanted to link it uh, to, uh, to a broader discussion, actually, drawing on popular culture. Uh, as you know, I'm a Star Trek fan. Uh, and of course, I refer to <clears throat> a TV series called Deep Space Nine, which ran uh, for seven consecutive years uh, back in the 1990s. Um, and it sort of features um, a planet called Bajor. Uh, and Bajor is a unique planet because <clears throat> within the sphere of Bajor, uh, there, is a, a, there is an opening to a wormhole. And the wormhole uh, takes travellers uh, from, um, from the alpha quadrant of the galaxy to the gamma quadrant uh, of the galaxy uh, through thousands and thousands of light years of space uh, in an instant. Uh, so as you can imagine, the wormhole <clears throat> is incredibly important as a pathway uh, from one part of the galaxy to another in terms of culture exchange and economic uh, exchange as well. Uh, now the bit feature of this uh, wormhole, according to the story, is it is occupied uh, by, um, by aliens. Uh, they live outside space and time, uh, but they are aliens nonetheless. Um, and, uh, you know, they have evolution. Uh, they have uh, well. It's not clear whether they evolved or just or just came into being, uh, but they occupy. Um, they are aliens. They're not metaphysical entities, and yet um, through various uh, visions and in spiritual encounters, the occupants of the of Bajor, the Bajoran Bajorans, um, they have a, a faith in, the, in what they call the prophets. Um, and even though the prophets have been re uh, revealed uh, as, in fact, aliens uh, occupying uh, the wormhole, um, the um, uh, Bajor people still insist uh, on calling them gods and prophets and worshipping them. Um, and it's, I can't help thinking, and I suppose the, the writers of the show 
TV show are actually atheists. And they're, what they're trying to say is that basically um, these rather peculiar people uh, are worshipping uh, light bulbs, really. I mean, <laughs> you know, we don't know how light bulbs work, uh, but we know they exist in our dimension. Uh, but because they're so fantastic, we end up worshipping light bulbs, um, even though light bulbs uh, are, are not otherworldly or other dimensional. Uh, they don't occupy another dimension. Um, they are of this world and in this world. Uh, and similarly, I think the writers of the TV show want to want to show that uh, the, the, the aliens that occupy the wormhole, um, they sort of occupy its kind of uh, inner recesses, as it were, um, and they created the wormhole, I think, um, and they're called the prophets by the Bajorans. Uh, they are not gods. Uh, they are not metaphysical. They're not transcendental. They are aliens, <laughs> and they occupy this universe uh, the same as, as we occupy it and the tables occupy this universe. They're on that same level. Uh, and yet, uh, the Bajorans, even though they know that they are aliens, uh, they insist on continuing to worship them as gods because their whole religion is in fact created, their whole culture is created um, on the assumption uh, that the prophets are totally transcendental, metaphysical, um, and have come, and their existence has come to them through revelation. Uh, rather than through uh, scientific demonstration, um, which is why they don't like, for example, um, uh, the humans teaching uh, that the uh, wormhole is in fact a physical phenomenon, uh, and by extension the aliens of the, that occupy the wormhole are, are physical uh, and phenomenon. Uh, they don't like them teaching that in, in, in the Joran schools uh, because it diminishes uh, the religious impact um, of belief uh, in, the, in the wormhole aliens. Uh, and more than that is a belief, of course, um, that the wormhole aliens called uh, prophets by the Bajorans uh, actually um, in, intervene in the lives of Bajorans uh, and they, uh, they uh, we have to respect the will of the prophets, that's a phrase that they use, uh, and, and the prophets do miraculous things for us and guide us morally, um, whereas in fact uh, there doesn't seem to be really much connection between Bajor as a planet uh, and the aliens uh, as, as um, you know, uh, as being part of this wormhole, which just happens to coincide uh, with, the, with the existence of Bajor. Um, so basically what the writers are trying to say is that it's all aliens, really. We, we think we are uh, worshipping gods, when in fact we're worshipping aliens. Uh, and of course, in fact, if we think of real, uh, of real aliens, uh, a, a, a movement started in the in the in the early seventies by Rial. Um, in fact, the Rial Rialians believe that um, you know that that the, the, there are no transcendental gods and there's no transcendental god. Uh, there are aliens uh, circling uh, the planet even as we speak, um, and these uh, aliens occupy the same physical universe. Uh, they're just uh, incredibly more uh, advanced and evolved than we are, um, to the point where I suppose uh, they are um, gods in the sense that they're so superior to us, uh, but they don't believe that they're superior to us. They're just uh, trying to show us, um, you know, how we can survive this planetary existence without blowing ourselves up in nuclear war. Um, so obviously... Uh, but they're not in the sense of being transcendental gods. They are just, just in inverted commas, aliens who occupy the same physical space as we do, uh, even though uh, they uh, manage to manipulate the laws of physics uh, to far greater advantage than, than we at present can, um, because they can warp drive and they can go through space and time and faster than the speed of light and, and all that. Um, but uh, they're not metaphysical. Um, and it's got me thinking, you know, really, that the problem with metaphysics, actually, um, is it, it's, not, it's, it's not transcendental enough, really. It sort of occupies this area below the sort of, below the abyss. Um, and if we look at the word metaphysics, which means before physics, it actually uh, derives from the, Plato, uh, from the idea of Plato, uh, the Platonic idea, 
uh, that uh, that everything that we see around us, like all the tables and this computer monitor that you're watching now and everything, um, basically it all has a mirror image, or not a mirror image, but an image, a transcendental image. Uh, and before everything was, um, there was its thought, it was, there was its form in thought. So God has thought of everything, this creator God has thought of everything, and he's created all these what they call forms, uh, and there's a form for heat, and there's a form for cold. Um, so before you have heat, and before you have cold, uh, you have something which comes before it, which is the thought of heat and cold in the mind of God. Uh, and that uh, comes before you have the phenomenon of heat and cold. And um, so it's very much a creator God has his thought, um, and he also has thought future thoughts. So he he thinks of washing machines, for example, and then they get invented, uh, and then they exist in the phenomenal world, having having previously existed in the, in the mind of God, and then uh, the mind uh, the mind of God uh, conceives of washing machines, uh, and through uh, various routes of of psychology, science, uh, technological development. Uh, they become manifested as physical washing machines, having once been only the form of washing machines in the mind of God. And so the Creator God is, has created everything in this world, including everything that we think that we have created, uh, which is this monitor that you're watching now, this computer that you're using now. Um, and it, so metaphysics um, are, these, are these forms uh, that come before the actual physical manifestation uh, of things that God has thought of um, and has yet to think of and has thought of before uh, and these things have come into manifestation. Uh, so it's very much posited on the Creator God and the Creator God of course uh, in Gnosticism is the same as the, as the Demiurge uh, and the Demiurge um, occupies all the occupies everything below this uh, this red ellipse that I've drawn here um, and indeed uh, he extends a little way further of course up until this uh, line which divides uh, the transcendental realm uh, from everything uh, below the abyss itself and this this little area here uh, it, I might call the abyss between the in between the actual so you have the metaphysical realm uh, which is the mind of God, the Demiurge, um, coming before the physical. Uh, but the metaphysical world of the Demiurge is still not as transcendental as the transcendental realm of the transcendental God, <laughs> if you follow me. Um, so we might say, you know, that this is the physical here. Um, this is the metaphysical. And then you have an abyss. Um, and then... Uh, above the abyss, you have the transcendental realm. Um, and the transcendental realm uh, does have a, uh, make itself felt, as it were, in inverted commas, uh, through the action of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Grail and the angels and the avatars uh, of the transcendental God. Um, and this is the sort of cosmological um, kind of explanation, as it were, of everything. Um, and talking of metaphysics, uh, that which comes before physics, uh, in, in Hinduism you have a thing called prana. Um, and prana it consists of two elements, pra, uh, pra and na. Uh, and pra, a na means breath. Uh, and so prana is before breath. So bef before there was breath uh, by before there was external respiration, uh, there was the platonic form of respiration, which was known as prana. And prana still exists uh, today uh, as a magical force uh, which shadows the breath. So you have uh, respiration, you have the breath, um, you have you know uh, external, internal respiration of sentient beings, and then you have this magical force called prana, um, which is uh, which is basically a sort of residue uh, of the mind of God uh, that first created uh, the thought of breath before breath became manifest. So prana uh, is still a siddha or still a magical power of the creator God. 
So even though you may be using prana or, or manipulating prana and directing it around the body through uh, pranayama, the, the breath awareness, um, or pranayama yoga, um, you are still uh, you still haven't transcended the creator God, um, as it were. So when we talk about transcendence, it really is transcendence. Uh, but it's complicated by the fact that we do have soul and God awareness, which we sometimes mix up with an awareness of the metaphysics of the Creator God. So there's a metaphysics of the Creator God which looks incredibly similar uh, to the transcendental qualities of the transcendental God in his transcendental realm. But in fact, they are not the same. Um, and this is where the sort of confusion uh, begins to grow within, uh, well, within and without Gnosticism. Uh, there's a confusion. A lot of people confuse psychism or the psychic realms with the transcendental realms, but the psychic realms themselves have been created uh, by the Creator God, and presumably, before but there was a thought of the phys of the psychic realm, before there was the psychic realm. Um, so we 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 become aware of the psychic realm, uh, but we are not aware that there is that which came before the psychic realm, uh, the sort of meta psychic realm, uh, which was created by the thought of the Creator God. Um, so it is confusing. Uh, the picture is rather confusing. Um, it's certainly very confusing when we think about the miraculous, um, which is re really when, when we become aware of God and soul, uh, and we become aware of miraculous uh, things that happen which defy the laws of physics, in fact, um, as we understand them, and even as we don't, as we understand them not, as it were, um, you know, we, we tend to mix up these miracles uh, as coming from, um, well, there are some miracles that come from the Creator God, the, the Demiurge, and there are some miracles that can, truly come from the Transcendental God. Uh, and it's very, very, very hard to, to dis discriminate between the two, um, which explains why people get very confused about uh, the psychic worlds being the sort of final destination of the soul, uh, when the soul, in fact, is, is its destination. It transcends the psychic worlds um, and, 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 and all the different, more esoteric uh, realms above the psychic realm, for that matter. Um, but I think the important thing is to remember that you have the physical, um, then you have the metaphysical, uh, and then you have an abyss. Uh, and then you have the transcendental. And were it not uh, for the beings that come from the transcendental realm um, and come down to us following this trajectory of the soul, uh, this sort of horseshoe shape that I've drawn here, uh, we would never be aware of the transcendental realm. Uh, we would never be aware of it. We would never be even, uh, we would, well, if it wasn't soul, we would never be connected to the transcendental realm. We would consist... We would simply be, um, you know, like molecules buzzing around uh, in a kind of in the sphere of the of the metaphysical and physical forever, uh, and we would never transcend either metaphysical or physical. Um, so again, a lot of people think that the god of Plato uh, represents the transcendental, uh, and he himself says it is. But in fact, it's not as transcendental as you might think it is. So, um, so and indeed. Um, the things that we think of are not, are not transcendental enough, which is why when we have a Gnostic experience, it transcends uh, even our conception of the transcendental. And you could say, of course, that this presentation itself uh, represents uh, the thoughts of one person, um, which are not as transcendental as he thinks that they are, although they seem to point um, to a transcendental, uh, which truly is transcendental. Um, but that, that's only on the sort of conceptual uh, level. On the level ex of experience, of course, uh, this presentation has no value at all uh, because we haven't experienced the transcendental at, at all. We've just been sort of uh, had it described to us, uh, potentially described to us by this presentation. Um, so, um, or maybe I just do think too much, really. Um, so... The conclusion is, I think, um, I suppose ultimately, by the time you get to the level of the abyss, 
Um, and this is some so it makes this a bit of a shaggy dog story because by the time you get to the abyss, the, the, the actual difference, as it were, between the transcendental realm and the and the etheric realms of the demiurge of the creator god become almost <laughs> uh, well, there's, there's only a thin thin bit of paper between them, you know. Um, it's like a bit of cigarette paper dividing the two realms, really. Um, but because there is a difference, um, you do have to, um, in your spiritual journey, follow the trajectory uh, of this horseshoe, um, rather than thinking that you can jump across the abyss uh, by your own creative will. Uh, which is what some people think that they can do. Um, and all you're going to do then um, is find yourself in increasing sort of folds of self-delusion. Um, so it, it is important, I suppose, that there is an abyss between transcendentalism and even between metaphysics. Um, and if you attempt to jump from the metaphysics to the transcendental uh, by your own will, as it were, uh, which is which is what they say the left hand path is concerned with. Uh, you're you're going to actually find yourself jumping there and then jumping well not jumping far enough and then jumping back uh, and getting completely ensnared um, in a whole lot of sort of veils uh, of um, of increasing delusion. In fact, uh, so the warning is there. Um, so you do have to become aware of soul and God to follow the correct trajectory. Um, which is which is sort of following the correct trajectory back to the true transcendental, um, and I suppose yeah, so. What I'm saying is that if you see the fiery, uh, like Ezekiel's uh, chariot of fire, uh, you have to make sure you jump on that chariot of fire because it's going to take you to the correct, uh, it, it, the correct destination, if I might call it that. Um, rather than taking you round and round in circles uh, or spirals, which is the alternative uh, to jumping on that fiery chariot, which is the correct chariot. So in Gnosticism, it really, you know, practice is important because you have to make sure you're jumping on the right chariot. <laughs> you're on the right train. Um, because if, you, you know, if you're not on the right train, you won't reach your, the right destination. So in that sense, I suppose some people might say that Gnosticism is rather rigid, is rather legalistic almost. Uh, it does sort of say, oh, you know, there is a right and wrong way. There is a right train to get on and there's a wrong train to get on. There's a right path to follow and a wrong path to follow. Um, there is transcendentalism and then there is transcendentalism. Uh, and you have to make sure that you're being aware of the correct transcendental level. Um, so, um, quite what this means uh, in terms of daily Gnostic practice, I've absolutely no idea. Uh, and possibly it's absolutely uh, got no re rele relevance at all, actually. Um, uh, and you just might as well, uh, you know, take this entire presentation with a bit of a pinch of salt, quite frankly, um, and get on with leading your contemplative life as a Gnostic, uh, really not taking much notice of cosmological speculation at all. Um, unless, of course, the, cosmologi the cosmological speculation itself uh, is part of the Gnostic life, um, which, which, in t which <laughs> given how enthusiastic I am about cosmological analysis, uh, may in fact be the case, or at least I'm hoping so, otherwise I'm just wasting my time and wasting your time with this presentation uh, entirely. <laughs>